I am I have a really privileged view on the on the issue of uh, human fertility and the future of having babies. Not because I'm actually watching people making babies uh, having sex, but I'm watching people making babies in a lab, and more and more babies are being born out of labs um, every year. And so the work that we do, the work um, of um, uh, helping people start a family couldn't be possible if it weren't for a number of technologies that are uh, have been developed for the last 40 years and especially in the last five years. Um, so there's a lot of the advancement of the field had to do with the work that your church has done, uh, including in genetic sequencing, which now allow us, for example, to test five-day embryos uh, that have been grown in labs. And we are now able to see, to find genetic illnesses that would uh, greatly impede the life of future children or would make them not even be born, meaning miscarriages, uh, thanks to this genetic sequencing technology. We also have been able to, we also have been able to uh, test embryos in different ways in women's uh, while they're pregnant, including amnios and an, a, an APT, non-invasive embryo testing or non-invasive prenatal testing. Um, and what we are doing is we're working on a fully automated embryology lab because right now everything is exciting about uh, the future of human reproduction except the cost. Uh, in fact, the other day I, I read an Instagram post that said that life doesn't, uh, that money doesn't make you happy unless you have to do an IVF, right? Because it costs $53,000 on average to have an IVF baby in the U.S. And so what I am working on also is in the democratization of this field in trying to make having babies more affordable. So one of the main reasons that we are failing so much at being able to have a baby is because now we're having babies later in life. We used to have babies in our teens and 20s, and humans are designed to have babies in the teens and 20s. But now we want to have them in the 30s and 40s. And that's where people fail around a third of the time um, in uh, having a family. And so, the main reason why people fail in the 30s and 40s and uh, having babies is the lack of uh, good quality oocytes or eggs. And so another field that we're working on very extensively is fertility preservation, meaning women freezing their eggs. And this is another technology that has been developed only in the last five years that is quite reliable if you get enough eggs. Um, and if you, do it, if you do it before a certain age. But having said this, fertility preservation is a very good alternative for people who want to reliably have babies in their 30s and 40s. We have other families who come to us. They're already in a relationship. They already have a child but they would like to have children later in life. And those people tend to freeze embryos, not eggs, because they're committed, they're in a relationship, and they can um, trust that they want to have the baby in the future with the same person. Um, and that's called banking embryos or freezing embryos. Um, Another thing that hasn't been possible before, and it's possible now, is for gay people to have babies. Um, so for two, for two um, men, gay men, to have a baby, and our clinics do that, um, that's, that, that is achieved through egg donation, through the use of the sperm of one of the two parents, and the use of a surrogate, um, who enables this process, a woman who enables this process for the two men. Now, 
if um, if we are able to get George in this conversation, I wanted to talk also about the future of fertility, which involves gametogenesis, right? So one of the biggest problems of human fertility is the ability to produce high quality eggs at the age that a woman wants to have a baby. So at George Church's lab, there's work going on which involves gametogenesis, which means the ability to create uh, eggs out of a skin cell, okay? Which I know sounds like absolute science fiction, but it's actually uh, happening. It's been done in mice. Nobody's been able to do it in humans. But I think if there's a place where they'll succeed doing that, it's at your church's lab. Now, how is this done? Well, there's, there's these induced pluripotent cells that have been, that were first developed in, in, out of Japan. And this is a technology that allows you to turn skin cells into any potential future cell. For example, a kidney cell, a liver cell, and potentially a human egg or a, hum, a human sperm. Uh, these would allow, for example, two women, two lesbian women, to have a baby without a sperm donor because you could make sperm out of a woman's skin cell and then you would have an egg. Um, you could potentially have two men have a baby and then you would need a, a uterus a, a, a surrogate to, to carry the baby, unless, of course, we get to the point where we can develop an artificial uterus. Now, to continue on the more extravagant use of this technology, um, there's people who are thinking about using these technologies for space colonization in the sense that if we want to travel to Mars, let's say, it it is it is uh, difficult to send uh, 100,000 people, but it's certainly not difficult at all to send 100,000 embryos, right? Um, it, it, would, it would be actually easy to send just in one trip. And embryos are, as you can imagine, tiny. And so there's future implications of this technology when you start talking about an artificial uterus, gametogenesis, embryo freezing, egg freezing, and let's say that the future of human fertility will be nothing like what we know now. But when I talk about these things, people sometimes find it horrific. They say, well, what about, what about two people having sex and making a baby? And as a father of seven children, I can tell you that I had them having sex and I had them in a lab. And I think that science is not there to make it difficult for people to behave the norm, the way they have always behaved. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, George. Welcome. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Let me finish the sentence and then I, yeah. I get you on. So I was just giving a general statement about science and saying that sometimes when it gets to human fertility, a lot of people are horrified by some of the developments. Uh, for example, gametogenesis, and they think it goes against nature. And I was saying that science gives you tools that you're, of course, well, you can use or not use uh, if you want to go in that direction. But now that I have you here, uh, maybe we could start by you telling us simply what are the most exciting things you're working at your lab that I think we would all love to hear about. Well, probably the one that's most relevant to what you've just been talking about is we're, we're trying to produce uh, large quantities of, of oocytes. Uh, so that there's uh, plenty to choose from. Some, some people take uh, six different rounds of IVF to get uh, a child. Um, and the method we're doing that has many other implications. We can turn uh, human stem cells now into 290 different cell types. We have 290 different recipes they give, uh, and many of these are in now preclinical trials uh, for curing things like um, um, demyelinating diseases like multiple sclerosis. 
So that's one category. We're, more complex organs uh, we're um, doing via engineering pigs, so engineering the germline of pigs to not only produce, to solve the, the crisis of limited amount of organs, but to produce better organ, organs that are less susceptible to infection, senescence, cancer, and so forth. We can do that because we can engineer the germline of pigs while we cannot uh, currently ethically engineer the germlines of humans to make an enhanced human organ. So these will be and better the idea organs is than we could get. Use organs in pigs. The idea is to, for example, use pigs to make livers that then would go to humans or kidneys that would go to humans. Exactly. So essentially every organ that is currently from human to human could be done from pig to human. And we and we've that are engineered at 42 different genes. So that's a kind of a record for uh, genome engineering, 42 at once. And we have now 2,000 of these pigs that are alive uh, and ready and, and are giving organs uh, in, uh, in primate uh, clinical trials to see uh, it. And we have a 320 day survival there. And is the rejection of these organs going to be more likely, less likely, equally likely than the rejection of the human donor? So initially it will be uh, about the same or a little bit worse. Uh, immune suppression is required even for human to human, but, but our goal is to get uh, high levels of tolerance and uh, hopefully eventually get away from uh, general immune tolerance general immune suppression to very specific tolerance for the the um, particular organs. And how many people do you have in total working at your lab? Uh, so the, the core part of the lab has about 90 people working in it, but we have a number of satellites um, that are little spinoffs that, that act like uh, many of them came from the postdoctoral fellows in my lab and, uh, and are eventually butt off as full-fledged companies. And is it true that you made a COVID vaccine out of your lab and gave it to yourself? Uh, the, it did not come from our lab. That was one of these satellite laboratories. Uh, we have um, uh, a new uh, COVID-directed uh, vaccine that ha has unique features of being uh, having uh, chitosan as an adjuvant having uh, specific peptides that interact well with the CD8 T cells um, and is nasally uh, delivered so, so you can do multiple deliveries in a ver at home very easily. Uh, this will be going into full clinical trials soon. So far, it's been in just a, kind of a, a, a low-level uh, trial so far. And let me ask you, since we're talking on the vaccines about the Chinese, the Sinovac, the Chinese vaccine that is a live attenuated virus, versus the Western vaccines, which tend to try to find exactly what is it that causes the, the antigenic reaction that will give you the antibodies that you need to prevent SARS-CoV-2. Why do you think the West went for a complicated approach when the Chinese are using the same approach we use for, for flu vaccines, for, for mumps, for rubella? Like, why are we trying to be more sophisticated and do you think what's better about our approach compared to their approach? Well, I think it's it's too early to say which one is better. We need we need to have multiple trials, and in fact, I think two approaches is not nearly enough. There's actually 207 last time I checked different uh, vaccine trials. I think the problem with the the attenuated is a good uh, approach for say polio, but it isn't necessarily a good approach for a virus. Um, where there is relapse, where there's long, quote, long haulers, people who, who, who stay uh, infected. Uh, there, there are many viruses for which we have no, or, or pathogens for which we have no uh, good vaccine after many years of work. For example, HIV, malaria, tuberculosis. Um, so we need, uh, and with COVID, we, we, we see that there are these long haulers and, and rec recurrent ones. So I, I think we, we need... Uh, more creative approaches because the virus has been ev evolved to use uh, its native state to evade the immune system in some way that's not fully understood yet. And we, so we need to completely change the way we're uh, probably, and we'll see which, yeah. Yeah, is your view that Trump 
got lucky or is it the Regeneron treatment that really stopped his infection at the right time? And, and, are, and do you believe monoclonal antibodies like Regeneron or Lily can be used not as a vaccine, but early, early on to prevent the spread of full-blown COVID? Well, I think it's too early to say about specific uh, examples like Regeneron's. Uh, uh, that's why we do the clinical trials. That's why we do them on large populations. And, and long-term effects are also important. Whether somebody got lucky or not, most people get lucky. I mean, if you get exposed to COVID, most people uh, do fine. Even people that are 74 years old, um, most of them do fine. But that doesn't mean we want, you know, 2% of our loved ones to be dying, okay? I mean, it's, there's, there, there's no reason to be cavalier about something. And we can't be basing things of, on end of one studies or anecdotes. Uh, we have to be basing it on large clinical studies. There's no doubt about that. But do you feel, for example, we know COVID kills not 2%, but more like 10% of people over 80, right? Do, yeah. we, do you think there, there should be maybe a trial focus on the elderly, um, since they are the ones that have uh, suffered this disease the most and have the most lethality? Or do you think vaccines, because we're trying to achieve a general level of immunity, should be given even to children who really suffer very little or almost not, not don't suffer from COVID? I mean, I, I think the fact that 90% of elderly get lucky and 99% of children get lucky doesn't mean we should ignore the one in the 10% by any means. Uh, we can have studies that are aimed at the elderly or aimed at particular genotypes. Uh, that's precision medicine and I'm all for it. Um, we don't have to have a one size fits all strategy. And I, I do hope we have enough, I, I think we have enough resources to, uh, to explore the, uh, the, all these cases. Very good. So I think we're running out of time in our conversation, but I want to give you the last word since you had problems connecting, maybe you'd like to say uh, something else before we close. I think we have a minute or two. Yeah, so yeah, so, so this uh, aging the, uh, aspect of COVID reminds us that aging is actually the cornerstone of almost all uh, morbidity and mortality, almost all diseases, even diseases you wouldn't think have to do with developmental biology and aging, like falling down, are greatly enhanced uh, as you age and not getting up uh, after you fall down. And uh, so a targeted approach at age-related diseases uh, is, is happening, is, is growing in momentum, and there's lots of examples. We have about a dozen examples where we can get aging reversal in animals and many of these are going uh, uh, well on their way towards clinical trials. So that would that would uh, that could conceivably address a, a lot of uh, human suffering. And do you think one of the problems of aid, of of finding therapies or treatments for aging is that the FDA doesn't consider aging an illness? I do. Uh, some of my colleagues think that's a problem. I don't think that's a problem. We're putting things to the FDA as curing specific diseases of aging. And if we happen to cure, you know, so far five different diseases uh, in, in uh, preclinical animal studies, uh, if, if the only thing those five diseases have in common is aging, we're probably getting at the core uh, component of aging. But the FDA will approve that just based on curing one of those diseases, and then it will be in play for all of them. Uh, so I, I don't think we have, I think the FDA is, is, is fine. Uh, we just need to be more uh, creative about, um, uh, and we should be looking at aging reversal, not longevity. Longevity takes too long to do the clinical trials. And again, it's not that you're starting with a healthy individual. Well, if you um, reverse aging and reverse uh, pre, you know, early stage uh, diseases of aging, then you've got a winner uh, and it's and easily compatible with the current system. Great, George. So I'm very glad we were able to have this conversation. Uh, yeah. And now we're uh, sending it back to you, Nico. Yeah, thank you. Thank everybody. you.